Hello, and welcome to another edition of Be News In Depth. I'm your host, Rich Hosford. This month, we are taking an in-depth look at an issue very much front and center of people's mind, how local medical and school authorities handle an outbreak of a virus or other disease. We will be talking to Board of Health member Dr. Wayne Saltzman first about the coronavirus, what it is, and how people can protect themselves. We'll also discuss how the Board of Health works throughout the year to help prevent people from getting sick. We'll also speak with Burlington Public Schools Superintendent Eric Conti and Assistant Superintendent Patrick Larkin about what the school department is doing to help keep both students and the community safe. The department recently canceled a number of after-school gatherings and a banned trip to Disney World, and we'll also talk about how that decision was made. We go to my conversation with Dr. Saltzman first on his view of the Novid coronavirus. Let's get started. Dr. Saltzman, thanks for joining us here today. Sure. Um, so just to give everyone sort of the lay of the land, you're here, it's March 6th, Friday, March 6th. Um, so every, all the information that we discuss, you know, about the current situation is, of, uh, you know, as of now, obviously. Sure. Um, so let's kind of go back a little bit, start at the beginning. You know, what is coronavirus or coronaviruses? What's COVID-19? How does it, how do they fit together? Sure, sure. Coronaviruses are not new. They have been around for a long time. Um, in fact, they are a major cause or a significant cause of the common cold. So there are different strains of virus. They are not the same as the flu virus or other viruses you heard about. They are their own unique group. What was found just a number of months ago in China that caused an illness similar to the flu, a flu-like illness, um, was a novel coronavirus, one that hadn't been described before. Not sure where it came from, uh, still kind of evolving information on how to approach it and treat it, but um, we know that it causes symptoms like fever and cough and shortness of breath, and those symptoms lumped together were called the disease that coronavirus, the novel coronavirus caused, and that disease now has a name, COVID-19. Coronavirus disease, COVID, mm -hmm. 2019, 19. Oh. So that's where, that's where this has come. And so the common thinking now, although the thinking is still evolving, is that it is passed through droplets, um, so when people sneeze, when people cough, uh, et cetera. Um, and uh, obviously we know about how devastating it's been in China, and we know that it has now gone to over 60 countries in the world. Um, we've heard about South Korea and Japan and Italy. Um, uh, and um, we know that um, it is, uh, has affected Washington State. Uh, we know that it's in California, in New York, and some other states as well, and we've heard up to now about the states of, uh, of emergency. And it's understandable that this, is, that this is scary. Right. But in Massachusetts, right now, the risk of COVID-19 is still low, as determined by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, um, MassDPH, working with the Centers of Disease Control or CDC. The risk is low. Conversely rich and important, uh, and importantly, um, the flu is still, the risk is still high. Right. And many more people, uh, as we know, have been affected with, um, with the flu. So um, it does not diminish what's happening with COVID-19, but the risk right now of COVID-19 in Massachusetts, just to repeat, is low, and when you think about it, other seasonal illnesses like the flu are still high. Right, I think that's one of the things that people are trying to wrap their heads around is because, you know, you hear numbers out of China that are very high, um, then you hear in the United States, you know, it's a, over 100 cases, then you think, well, that's not, you know, how do I look at 100 cases? Is that a significant number? I mean, it's not a lot of people compared to the population, but I think 
you know, help us sort of like, how should we be viewing this? I think that we should be aware. Um, I think that there, the, the concerns that we should have, and that's coming from, um, from a doctor, a doctor who takes care of older adults. Right. The concerns that we should have are, um, you know, are we staying informed? Um, uh, the uh, Burlington Board of Health is, is really working to stay informed. Um, I, are we protecting ourselves? And by that I mean, um, are we doing the same things we would do for any virus that seems to be transmissible, like um, like the coronavirus, like the flu virus? Are we, if we are becoming ill, are we are we removing ourselves from other people so that we don't make other people potentially ill? Um, are we doing simple things? I have to tell you, uh, I recently came back from California myself, and I was walking down the aisle of the plane, and um, I watched somebody literally go. A chew, like that, and I thought, "Wow, we are not conveying information well. Right. We should be protecting our sneezes in some way, our coughs in some way. We should be washing our hands regularly or using the um, the alcohol or non-alcohol based um, uh, 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 washes. You know those kinds of things. Um, you know." I am most concerned about the older adults, the medically complex older adults, because their systems are much more fragile and they can become much more significantly ill. Um, and so uh, I think common sense okay. plays a big role here. Um, and like I said, staying informed, seeking information, and um, understanding that there's a lot of work being done in our country right now with regard to testing and understanding and conveying information. It's a, it's a mishmash, but it's, um, but it's all meant to try to get our arms around it and help protect um, our communities. Now, I know it's probably, might be early to, to tell, but you know, is there a sense of how transmissible um, you know, coronaviruses compared to the flu, for example? Do we, do, do we have people, researchers kind of gotten their sort of handle on that yet? So um, I have watched the same news reports that you have watched right. and everyone else has watched. Um, you know, Dr. Anthony Fauci um, uh, from the NIH, the CDC folks, even our government officials. Um, we're still learning what's yeah. going on. Just yesterday I saw a doctor from one of our downtown hospitals say it's conveyed via droplets. Um, we do have information from, uh, limited information, I think it's from Singapore, I think I saw, that it is on surfaces, but it can be, a significant amount can be removed with, um, with typical cleaners that we use, either bleach-based or things like that. So there is information coming, you know, they're, they're talking about um, being three to six feet away from somebody who might be infected or limiting yourself. Um, so uh, I don't think we have an understanding yet of comparing it to things that we feel comfortable or understand, like right. the cold and like the flu. So, but right now the thought is that it is droplets and that we should be doing everything we can to uh, limit our coughs and our sneezes if we're not feeling well. And then just make sure that we're trying to maintain our own um, hygiene as best as possible. Hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. That's what we know for now. But information rich is changing daily. Right. Um, you you mentioned you know we're all watching the same news. You know, as a doctor, as somebody who sort of views these things with you know the scientific kind of perspective, how do you think you know some of the coverage of this has been sort of done? How would you rate some of the some of the coverage of as far as like conveying to the public the right information and the right tone, I guess. You know, I I, I, try, I try not to be political. I want to be a I, yeah. I want to be a doctor. So you know, from a, a doctor point of view, am I am I satisfied with the information as it has been coming out? You know, I think so because I've been turning to those folks that I know are. Um, uh, are knowledgeable about things like viruses in general. And you know, who's better than the CDC? I know there's been some issues with regard to testing kits and things like that, but when it comes to who I would turn to for the facts, 
so that I can try to maintain calmness in the folks that I'm treating or that my colleagues are treating. Um, I think that those entities are really conveying things very well. But for all intents and purposes, you know, I guess in the big picture, it's kind of caught us off guard. Yeah. Um, you know, it was in China, the majority of it is in China, and then now it's in Iran and, and in Italy and, and just all the inf other information that's coming and business is affected and, and all of this, it's just scary. But I know that there are scientists out there who have baseline knowledge and are doing their best of, for conveying. So um, I, I would say continue to stay informed, as I said, and, and more information will be coming. And so let's talk, you know, a little bit at the local level. What what are some of the things that you know the, the Burlington Board of Health, you know, are engaging in or planning on? How are they keeping up with the latest information? So what what are some of the things that you that you guys are sure. doing? Sure, sure. I am an elected member of the Burlington Board of Health. You know, as you know. Um, so our chair, Dr. Ed Weiner, our director, Susan Luminello, kind of asked me to get a little bit more. Um, public for our, for our community just to help convey information. But I gotta tell you, our director and the Burlington um, uh, Board of Health staff are doing amazing stuff uh, based on informing, supporting, and helping our town to prepare. So Director Luminello is working with all of our uh, municipal departments in making sure that there are plans in place um, to keep people as safe as possible, but also to keep those things that make our um, uh, town work, DPH, fire, police, et cetera, um, make sure those are as stable as possible. Director Luminello is communicating with um, Leahy, um, their community benefits uh, folks to make sure that there is a connection. So what the Burlington Board of Health is um, is conveying is not only consistent with what is happening at the federal level, CDC, the state level, Mass DPH, but also mm -hmm. local with regard to our own our own hospitals. So I would say um, Director Luminello is on the phone. Uh, for the majority of the day, uh, not only taking phone calls from our community, but also making sure our municipality is as informed, supported, and prepared for what may be yet to come um, moving forward. So when you say things like, you know, the other like police and fire department, it's sort of helping them understand the best ways to protect themselves when they're out in the mm, public mm, kind of mm, thing? Mm. Is that yeah, I, I mean, uh, People are talking about the term business continuity. Um, you know, what do we need to do in order to make sure that under a crisis, whether it be this or something else in the future, you know, we run that yearly emergency disaster drill that we call a flu clinic. Right. You know, what can we do to make sure that people are prepared and that no matter what happens, there is a plan so that business can continue. So, um, you know, uh, Director Luminello is working with um, uh, Administrator uh, Sagarino for our town that the, the, uh, the selectmen have given the Board of Health confidence to help support our town. So I, I think the goal is to help make, make sure that things continue safely and consistently even while there is the potential for distress moving forward. And what are some of the... You know, so as of right now, what are the recommendations for, you know, the schools or for other, for businesses, for people, you know, as far as like gatherings go? You know, you said the risk, the low, risk is low. Um, so what, what's the sort of advice right now as far you, as? You know, it's a great question. And um, while I was in California and watching what was going on in the government and listening to key scientists and um, infectious disease experts talking about this, something um, uh, really struck me, and that was the term business as usual. Business as usual, but, in, but also common sense. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have it, we should use it. You know, if you are not feeling well, um, or you have um, been exposed and are still feeling well, been exposed either directly uh, to the areas that have had significant um, uh, outbreaks or or media um, relations about uh, about COVID nineteen, or you have interacted with somebody who may have been um, who you think may have been ill and have been at one of these spots. Keep yourself 
keep yourself um, self quarantined. It's a terrible word, quarantine, but right. but we use it for a reason. And um, uh, you know, and if you are out in public, common sense for maintaining, you know, sneezes and coughs and things like that. And uh, you know, but putting on a mask and going outside um, is not doing anything and the CDC has said that you know wearing masks out in public because you think you're preventing receiving etc we know that's not the case um, uh, and so um, as of right now risk is low um, and we should be kind of carrying on businesses a as usual I haven't heard anything to the contrary but common sense I think um, always plays a role okay now um, obviously, trying to not cause any alarm or anything, but right. like, what would you know if what would happen or what kind of situation might uh, you know arise that that recommendation would change a little bit? Like maybe you know cancel big sporting events or you know places where the people gather. Would that would that just be a couple cases in the state, or would it have to be something a little bit more than that? So I honestly don't know okay. what what that number or issue would be. Um, but our director, Luminello, is um, monitoring every day the Mass Department of Public Health site and um, the CDC information and is updating um, every day that information online, Burlington.org, public health alert, click right on it, get the information. But you know, our governor, he's been in healthcare. He, That's true. he understands um, he understands the issues. I believe that our, our state representatives and senators are are um, responsible and clued in. So I think we have a really good infrastructure about helping us, the community, understand how we need to proceed appropriately. So um, I would defer and trust that those individuals are going to relay when they think that we should start acting a little bit differently. Okay. Um, so we have state, federal, local information that is coalescing and we're trying to keep in order for our community. All right. Um, I think I want to just get over, go over some of the, the real basics right now. Um, so obviously you've mentioned some of them, but you know, protecting, coughing into the, yeah, sure. into the, the crook of the elbow sure. uh, or sneezing as well. Um, hand washing. There's a certain like technique and time limit that or time that people have been talking a lot about. Yeah. I think it's a couple of songs. So this is what I do, um, and uh, it was what I was trained to do way back when I was um, an early doctor. So hand washing, warm water, um, nice lather, and I personally sing Happy Birthday. So okay. the entire Happy Birthday. And um, in particular. <laughs> <laughs> um, so making sure that you know you're really doing a good job, everything from your nail beds in between your fingers, um, thorough, um, rinse thoroughly, shake out excess, um, turn off if you can without using your hands, mm -hmm. and then have a towel or something clean handy that you can wipe off. And if you're using a public space, um, keep your, you know, either get an extra towel or keep the towel with you and use it to grab the handle, the handle or of the other door that you're opening and then throw away. Um, that way, you know, at least you've done your best to maintain your, your cleanliness and, um, and move on. Okay. Um, one other thing that I don't think people think about very often, um, about cleanliness are these little things that we all carry around with us. Yeah. Suggestions for, yeah. So I mean, you know, um, cleaning these, you know, when when um, uh, when SARS was in 2003, and then we had H1N1 2009 2010, we didn't, you know, we had cell phones, but we weren't as um, prolific with them then as we are today. They're like an appendage. So the recommendations are to clean your cell phone. Obviously, not getting the big moist you know, towelette, but just wiping down your cell phone as you would wipe down any surface. And the recommendations that I heard of actually today, specifically from an IT guru um, on the news was just keep those off the screen. You know, use a warm cloth with warm water or something, but don't put the cleaning agents on the screen. Okay. But wipe down your phone. 
I mean, what are you touching the most during the day is your phone. Wipe down um, handles, um, commonly held uh, spaces in your, in your home. There have been studies even before co this coronavirus COVID-19 issue that have showed that most of the bacteria from the hands are on the commonly used surfaces that we really don't, don't think about, doorknobs, um, et cetera. So common sense, common sense. Yes. Um, no. Did you have something else to add? <laughs> no. Because <laughs> any advice is good. <laughs> um, touching the face, people have been talking a lot yeah, about that. Yeah, I mean, it's really so, hard. I, I mean, it, it, is, it, it, it is hard, but, um, you know, we don't think about it, but you, there are entrances, um, you know, uh, eye, nose, mouth, et cetera, we don't think about. Um, you know, our, our president made a, made a note of it in, um, in one of his um, uh, town halls about, you know, trying to reduce touching the face. Um, you know, uh, 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 other things, you know, if you uh, making sure you have enough medicine in, in the house, things we don't really think about otherwise. If you're running low on medicine, you're thinking, oh, I can wait, I can wait. Uh, make sure you have your medicine available just in case you can't get out um, uh, uh, as easily. You know, um, uh, if your kids are, are ill, um, you know, even if you think it's just a cold, may want to call the schools, seek further advice, and keep fo and, and keep your kids home. And believe me, as a parent, um, you know, my kids are older now, I remember that was a huge, huge issue um, for parents, you yeah. know. Um, but um, we need to think a little bit differently, and we need to just make sure we're doing what we can to um, protect everyone. Excellent. Well, I think that's all very good advice. Um, I'm going to transition over to our sort of ge more general conversation, but we'll do that right after this. Okay. We now go to the second part of my interview with Dr. Salzman about how the Board of Health works continuously to address health-related issues. All right, and we're back. Um, so I know we ended our uh, COVID-19 discussion um, in the last segment, but there's a couple of little things that t kind of tie in. Uh, what is one of the, the other recommendations from the Board of Health that the Board of Health can kind of help people with? Yeah, and it's so important, and thank you for, for asking. The flu shot. Um, along the recommendations of what we can do in order to um, better protect ourselves, one continues to be the flu vaccination. So the, f the vaccination this year is 45% effective, and I wanna make sure people understand what that means. Okay. But, um, but we know that for all the strains of flu that are active this year, the flu vaccination is covering them all. So it, right on the money, that's great. When I say that the flu vaccination is 45% effective, many people think, oh, it only works 45% of the time. But that's not what it means. Okay. It means for people who get the flu vaccination, they have a decreased risk of getting a flu-related illness um, or flu illness by 45% compared to those who don't get the vaccination at all. Oh, okay. So getting the flu vaccination is protective, an extra, an extra 45% protective against the flu. And I'm not just talking about um, uh, preventing the flu altogether, but the severity of symptoms and um, the consequences of symptoms, especially in older, fragile adults, which might be, for example, um, a pneumonia. And I can tell you, Rich, I had the flu this year. I got the flu shot. I don't know. Um, uh, but the severity of the flu that I had, I can only imagine how much worse it would have been had I not gotten the flu shot. So um, it's also one way of taking that confounder, the flu, out of this COVID-19 picture. So part of the recommendations for supporting ourselves is also, if you haven't done it, please get the flu shot if you are safe to do so. Okay. And you say, and you kind of made mention that it's even more important with the coronavirus going on, maybe because one, if you get, someone gets the flu, they might, what, kind of panic? Yeah, uh, so the symptoms can be very similar. 
and um, uh, and so we want to make sure that we take that out of the picture because right. these symptoms just seem to overlap. And of course, what are people going to be thinking about? Even though the flu risk, as I've said before, in it's, a state of Massachusetts, right. is high, and we've had tens of millions of flu cases, and sadly, a significant number of deaths as well. Um, you know, uh, people are thinking right now about COVID nineteen. Um, when we want to make sure that they're also protecting themselves against the flu. So I think talking about the flu is a good way to sort of go into our, the next sort of topic of conversation. And that is kind of big picture, you know, outside of coronavirus and, you know, the news of the day, the different ways that the Board of Health works kind of throughout the year to try to help keep the population, you know, safe and healthy. So I know you have, you have flu clinics. What are some of the other things that happen kind of behind the scenes as far as maybe monitoring different situations or, you know, trying to get different information out to the public. What are some of the ways that, you know, the Board of Health is working to, you know, year round to, you know, keep people healthy? Sure. And the Board of Health is working um, year round. So um, the Board of Health, and I also I, I must say that you have to get Director Luminello on because she can give you the down and dirty. So I can give you kind of the overview. But the Board of Health, we have a supervising nurse, Chris Pollock, who's wonderful. And she gets information on a daily basis from the state as to um, different communicable illnesses that might be around to watch for. Um, uh, uh, she, is, um, she also gives other types of vaccinations, um, uh, helping out the, the schools. Um, uh, we have the flu clinic, we check blood pressures. Um, uh, we have a sunscreen program in the summer. Um, you know, we are, as I said, we're very tightly working with the schools uh, to make sure that um, kids are protected, especially kids who might require some additional um, vaccinations, um, uh, having nothing to do with any of this, but just childhood vaccinations. Um, so, uh, and of course, we're we're making sure that all our food establishments also right. are, are, are healthy. So it's, um, you know, so it's not only uh, helping uh, um, with regard to illnesses, it's helping to make sure that the overall health of the of the uh, of the community. But the Board of Health is really doing a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of great stuff. And I would I would advise people if they're interested, go to Burlington.org and click on the Board of Health. And everything we're doing, all recommendations, um, are are right there for the community to review. Excellent. And what kind of you know training or preparation goes in? throughout the year as far as like, you know, for in case of emergencies. Like what sort of, you know, work gets done? Is there, are there internal training programs that happen? You know, what, you know, so when something like corona happen, you know, sure. arises that, you know, people are sort of ready to act. Well, uh, as you know, as our, I hope our community knows, um, every October we have our large flu clinic, mm -hmm. which is actually an emergency disaster drill in which we have follow emergency um, disaster protocols. Uh, folks don't know it because they're essentially coming in, getting registered, getting their shot and going home. But there's actually a whole process that ha that's, that's being taken about making sure people are registered, that we know, we know who has come through the doors. Um, you know, our town clerk keeps data on which uh, vaccination lots have been given um, the batches, etc. Um, uh, we know how much we've used. We know how to order. Um, it's actually a really big process. So if some other emergency um, occurs that requires, for example, vaccination or gathering folks together for a treatment, we can do it. I would be remiss not to mention our medical reserve corps. Right. Um, so. Uh, over 150 members who do have regular trainings and regular meetings um, just to make sure that we're all working together and able to follow a chain of command and instruction for uh, cohesiveness and seamless um, uh, completion of uh, tasks. Um, I know that our director and staff undergo um, regular uh, trainings uh, offered by the state or other states in order to make sure that they are up to speed on the latest 
uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, management issues for um, for disaster, sheltering, etc. Uh, we have shelter drills. We have uh, stop the bleed drills. Yep. Um, we have CPR training. So. Um, a lot of things are going on uh, in order to make sure that we have a force ready to help our town and neighboring towns, if if need be, um, to move forward. And how does the board sort of work with? I mean, you made mention, you know, the town clerk is part of the training, and mm -hmm. there's a lot of, um, you know, but how does how does the board sort of like work with other departments in town throughout the year, like on a regular basis? Um, I know that. Uh, our director ha it has a relationship with the local um, emergency management division through the fire department. She works with the fire department, with the police, with the town administrator, with the selectmen. Um, uh, she really uh, she really integrates with the entire town so well. Um, our health agent uh, um, is involved in um, in all the permitting, state regulation stuff. We have an environmental engineer that makes sure that new projects in town are safe. I think the the board of health is um, is kind of a central hub. Uh, if you imagine a, a wheel of a bicycle, it's a central hub that has spokes that go that go everywhere throughout the town to maintain the safety and the health of the town. Um, I'd also be remiss, um, the Board of Health puts together a yearly um, uh, uh, fair, right, um, just coming up. A, a health fair coming up, and, it's, and it is currently going, um, it's going to happen as of mm -hmm. right now, and um, brings together over 60 vendors and speakers and things like that to advocate for health in our town. Excellent. And on the state level, um, you know, how, both how the board, you know, the Board of Health works with state agencies or just state agencies in general, just as far as, you know, monitoring situations and preparing for sort of worst case scenarios or worst case scenarios. Uh, our director and the staff has a close relationship with the Mass Massachusetts Department of Public Health, DPH. Um, in fact, that's kind of the governing you know, entity for the municipalities to understand what the current concerns are, what the current regulations are, um, and uh, how those all uh, um, apply to, main, to maintaining our municipality. Um, there's also information, as I had said, that the supervising nurse and the Board of Health gets on a regular basis from the state and beyond regarding um, any communicable diseases, uh, et cetera. Uh, if uh, we have folks who need to have um, monitoring, specific monitoring, uh, due to a disease of taking medications, um, direct observation therapy, DOT therapy, we're involved in that. Um, so a lot of things in the in the in the in the background that are that are going on, but um, tight connection to the state. And I'm guessing the state, and even, of course locally, you've mentioned it in the last piece. You know, they work with like area hospitals, or you know, to see you know what are you seeing, what are, anything happening. Well, our town is unique, right? We have a we have a major level one trauma center. Yeah. Um, uh, right around the corner, and so. Um, uh, Leahy Hospital has always had um, tight ties to Burlington. Um, we have great relationships with their community benefits um, folks. Um, you know, a significant number of our community go there, and so it's vital that we maintain a, a really good relationship with them. And of course, they're tied to Winchester Hospital, so that's a neighboring town. So um, it's crucial that we, uh, we maintain um, uh, communication and understanding. And uh, just uh, yesterday, our director told me that she would be following up with regard to uh, uh, what Leahy is, um, how Leahy is going to be benefiting the town more and what the plans are around COVID-19. So that should be coming soon. OK, so a lot of cooperation, everybody. Oh. Kind of all hands on board, sort of working together. So, so I can say that the town of Burlington, at least as, a, as my town and the town I know, is uh, so collaborative and everyone's working together um, so well that our community should be very proud of its municipality and what it's doing um, every day, COVID-19 aside, to maintain the security and stability of our town. Now, one of the things that I've, I'm curious about is, you know, sort of, 
getting kind of into the weeds a little bit, sure. but um, you know, the sort of setting up of the infrastructure so that the cooperation is there when, let's say, you know, we'll use COVID-19 as, as sort of like our, our point of discussion, but you know, if a va um, you know, vaccine or something is developed, sort of how the process that are, and the interactions that are already in place sort of help you know, make it easier to get it to where it needs to be. Yeah, I mean, I grew up with um, with a rule that uh, uh, you know we called the five P rule: proper preparation prevents poor performance. Right. right. So, what are what are other uh, aspects of our municipality doing all the time? Our police, our fire, they are consistently training, 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 so that when they are needed, everything is. Um, is understood and there's a process and they do it. The Board of Health is no different. The Board of Health is continuously training, training, training. What do we do if we need to set up a shelter? What do we do if there's an emergency disaster drill and we have to make sure that um, Medicine X is refrigerated at a certain temperature. How do we get Medicine X from one place to another? How do we mobilize people uh, to be available to help distribute Medicine X or gather folks and calm our community? Training, 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 so that when the time comes, um, people are prepared. So uh, I know that our director um, and the Medical Reserve Corps uh, and the medical reserve region that we're, we're associated with, it's all about training and preparation. And so uh, um, people don't know that. So I'm, I'm glad you're asking to know that our Board of Health is, is really working with everyone else to make sure that we are prepared. Yeah, I think that was what I was looking for. Because uh, like you said, you know, along with COVID-19, there's a lot of concern out there. People are a little nervous. So I appreciate you coming in both sort of, you know, giving a sort of clear-eyed, you know, talk about the current situation, sure. but also sort of, you know, the reassurance that behind the scenes that people don't even know there's, you know, a lot of hardworking, dedicated people sort of, you know, fighting for the health of the community. I, this is my community. I, I love the town of Burlington. My wife grew up here. My children have gone to school here. Um, I am delighted to give back. I'm delighted to be on the Board of Health. Uh, uh, and anything I can do to help support the efforts of our town, uh, I and many others are ready to come to task. All right. And we'll have you in for those regular updates while this thing is going on. And delighted. Just let, let people know, you know, just as much of the true information as we can get out there. Yeah, absolutely, Rich. Happy to do so. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> We go now to my conversation with School Superintendent Eric Conti and Assistant Superintendent Patrick Larkin, who have been monitoring the situation with the Board of Health and other agencies and making some decisions about after-school events and other extracurricular activities. Let's take a look. Um, thank you both for coming in. I know it's sort of quick last minute for you to, you know, we just made the announcement yesterday about some of these cancellations. I just wanted to sort of touch base. What's the current situation uh, with the schools? Do we, we don't have any suspected cases or anything like that, correct? Um, no. So I think that uh, we don't have any presumptive positive tests of students or staff. Right. Um, and uh, we meet regularly and speak regularly. Patrick's been in uh, contact as well with the Board of Health and Susan Luminello, who's been, again, extremely helpful. Um, and so this isn't just a school challenge, this is a community challenge, which involves obviously both um, um, town departments and agencies and, and the school department. Now, just a big picture, you mentioned working with the Board of Health. What, is, what do the schools, the department do just to kind of, kind of, when something like this is sort of percolating, to sort of start you know, keeping track of things? Well, I think the first is to have good communication. So I think, um, again, Patrick, you've been attending a lot of the meetings. I've been attending a lot of the meetings. Um, so I think that's where it starts. And just um, when you said a situation like this, which is kind of funny because yeah. um, one of the challenges is um, we don't have a history of too many situations like this. So yeah, I think that's thankfully. why, um, thankfully, but I, I'm saying it's uh, usually um, 
our conversations are about uh, a weather cancellation, a snow day cancellation, not necessarily right. uh, canceling things for um, for a, a for a virus uh, or for a potential infection or something like that. But we do track absences uh, every year during flu season in particular, and if we find out there's a lot of students out at a certain school, like we make calls and it may impact a particular classroom and we'll let families know and reinforce the hand washing criteria, which you hear a lot right now with this current situation. So um, the communication about absences and illnesses is really nothing new for us. Obviously, we don't know the implications for this one due to the fact that this is a virus that people aren't as familiar with. It's brand new this year. So um, again, it's, it's great for us, like Eric said, to have the support of the Board of Health locally and just to be able to get together and also superintendents um, across the state are sharing with one another what they're dealing with so um, just that type of community support is what we want to make sure all of our kids are safe not just in Burlington but across the state and staff of course. Right. Now I'm sure most people have seen the letter that you sent out last night but just sort of recap what what kind of activities are being canceled and what made you sort of uh, go for that decision? Well, I think what changed for us was the declaration of a state of emergency by the governor and then mm -hmm. the governor shutting down or um, canceling some state functions. And so one of the challenges here is the guidance that we're getting isn't very definitive. Um, uh, I should say some of it is. So, so like as Patrick said, the, the, the flu protocols have been in place for a while. Cover your mouth, wash your hands. Um, that are, you know, making sure our custodians clean well. Those are things that we do typically. Um, but when the governor said, okay, there's a state of emergency that he's worried about uh, stopping, uh, mitigating the spread of the uh, virus in the communities, when he had um, made a much stronger statement about international travel, I think it was last week, um, his statement this week was uh, more focused on uh, domestic travel. Um, and um, limiting sort of large gatherings of people. The city of Boston canceled the uh, St. Patrick's yeah. Day Parade, which, is, uh, was, which was significant. So um, that's really what changed for us uh, around 3.30. And uh, we had some large gatherings uh, of adults that were happening tonight. So we had to move uh, relatively quickly. And we're still trying to look at some future events and catch up and always trying to balance um, wanting the students, the children to have that experience, um, but also looking at uh, safety. So I think, um, and without any clear criteria. So what is a large gathering? N no one has made that determination. Right. Um, uh, the virus um, doesn't seem to have that pernicious an effect um, with uh, children 18 or younger, which is sort of my primary concern. So I think what we discussed is, um, any events that have large groups of adults coming together in the school because we don't have any control over um, where the adults are working, sort of their exposure, what they've seen. So, um, and other activities where our kids are getting together, the kids are together all day during the school day anyway. So again, we're gonna try to keep the kid events open and then try to um, cancel or postpone events where large groups of adults are, are coming in and that could be parents or grandparents wanting to see sort of an event with a kid. So an uh, example of that might be the All Town Band concert where we might have um, four or five hundred spectators come in. Right. Uh, back to school night um, you know, would be something that's a possibility. But the SATs, which are occurring this Saturday, are still happening. So I just want to make sure I say that. So because right. that students are coming into classrooms, we're going to keep track of the classrooms they're in. We're going to do it real good job cleaning up those classrooms um, but students are coming into school anyway so it doesn't make sense to cancel that event from my perspective I'm not sure if you want to add yeah, anything. Yeah some local trips I know like our middle school ideas kids are going to drive on a bus to Bedford tomorrow it's 10 kids going to a conference where there might be other schools that send 10 kids again if a parent didn't want their child to go that's fine but um, we feel uh, again it's kids among kids typical to what we do during the school day so that's something that we will um, continue to support tomorrow like things might it might be different if it were next week but as of tomorrow again um, I think it's something that we would support 
Yeah. I mean, we, we were talking off air, you said, kind of made the point that, you know, the students are interacting with each other anyway. So, you know, if they do so for an extra hour after school, it doesn't make a difference when you have other people coming in that right. really... But, right, but things have been changing daily for us. So I'm uh, saying this now, and we might be on uh, tomorrow, and the state might shut schools down for, for, um, right. for a, a period of time. So I think we're preparing for that um, in terms of our conversations and sort of determining some of the, what the logistics would be. Um, and some, the state, the commissioner of education has really relaxed some of the accountability measures that we're held accountable for. Um, in terms of um, absences and in terms of a uh, number of days that are that are required for us to go so um, People are, I think are responding and providing a little bit more latitude, but no one has made a sort of a clear decision as to um, Whether schools are going to stay open or, or, or getting closed for any right. period of time. Yeah, it's a fluid situation Nobody really knows exactly what's going on. Right. Um, you mentioned cleaning. I I know from some of your correspondence is that it has been sort of an up, a step up in sort of just how thoroughly the schools are cleaned and, you know, it's just trying to make sure everything's sort of safe. Right. And again, I'm going to, Patrick's done a lot of work in this area too, so I'm going to make sure he answers. But uh, in, in saying we're sort of stepping up the cleaning, I don't want to convey that our buildings weren't well, clean or people no, weren't doing what they're wanting. I don't but, want to convey that but, but I'm saying uh, an example might be, um, I think at the middle school and at every school, um, even during classes, um, custodians are sort of walking around, wiping down handrails and, and doorknobs and, and uh, disinfecting uh, throughout the day. Um, and they might have in the past done a more concentrated cleaning like that once the kids leave the building, but now it's sort of ongoing and they're trying to keep surfaces clean. And then our teachers, Patrick, we, we're getting them. Oh yeah, so um, we ordered, I think would we had 50 more cases of wipes which are hard to come by at this point and um, we have had spray out in the classrooms um, all throughout the year and just to try to put more cleaners in classrooms so teachers can clean during the day or have kids like clean their desk after um, a certain amount of time so again we're just trying to be overly cautious on keeping you know classroom spaces and hallways and doorknobs clean um, based on the way this virus can be transmitted. And hand washing. So again, our teachers do that anyway, but I think they're taking more time and might be taking more frequent breaks, especially at the elementary level, to make sure kids have an opportunity to, um, to wash their hands, and then they do it for the right amount of time, and so we're doing a lot of that uh, reinforcement, um, in, in certainly at the elementary level. Yeah, I've heard the, the teacher across the hall from our studio here reminding students to wash their hands. Yeah. And, um, and to your point, you know, we also, being here in the high school, have, you know, have the same services for the custodians, and they do a great job. I wasn't trying to no, suggest no, I, they I, don't, yeah. Yeah, but I know there's been sort of a step up um, so just in, in response to this. Um, so, you know, I, I get, you know, we talked about why we canceled the, you know, the events where the, the public comes in. Um, was the trip just, you know, because of... Disney is a popular place. Was it more the air travel that was a concern? What kind of went into that as being included? Um, I think for me, it was largely the uh, governor. Either the state of emergency. Saying that and also really, I think he did focus on um, domestic uh, travel, domestic field trips. So okay. I, I think that was a clear part of his statement. and. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. I'm assuming because it's a it's an unknown area. I'm assuming air travel is is being uh, discouraged, especially for I know for um, people in the high risk um, areas. Again, not necessarily kids, but uh, um, I, I think I just think it's the unknown is, yeah. is is what I think, and it was discouraged. I think from watching the governor yesterday, um, he was pretty clear on the fact that he was taking these steps proactively because he wants to limit community spread. And I, I'm sure the doctor from the Board of Health did a session with you and will probably did, yeah. be doing more, um, was great. Um, so he could articulate this way better than I can. And I'm nervous about people that are amateurs passing along secondhand information because it comes out wrong sometimes. But my understanding was, um, you know, if we're not cautious about this now, we could have more cases 
folks that need hospital care for other things or basic things won't be able to get into the hospitals. He's really trying to um, limit, you know, the crunch that our healthcare system goes through dealing with this and making sure we can try to, again, limit community spread. So I think that's why we're taking these precautions, again, from listening to him yesterday. And obviously, by declaring a state of emergency, he has access to um, certain funds and resources that he wouldn't necessarily have if he didn't declare that state of emergency. So, okay. Now, you know, one s small fortunate um, aspect of this right now, you know, within the next couple of weeks is we're sort of between sports seasons. But looking ahead, you know, when spring season sort of starts to ramp up, if the situation is somewhat similar to right, right now, for mm -hmm. instance, what, what might be the, you know, any changes to the, to the sports schedule? Or? Um, I don't think initially. Most of our, um, I think spring sports compete outside. I think there's plenty of room for people to have that social distance that they talk about. Right. Um, if, um, if you were to tell me now, um, I just attended a couple of the, the playoff uh, games from the winter sports teams where the gym was packed full of people. Um, an event like that um, we might need to change, but I think just a regular game where, um, again, parents have some room to spread out, it's outside. Um, I don't think there would be any reason to, um, like they're doing in Italy, what, playing their, their so soccer games yeah. in, in empty stadiums. <laughs> empty stadiums. Uh, I, again, I don't think we get those type of crowds, um, and so I think that uh, we would, you know, we'd be okay. Um, but. Honestly, it's going to depend on the recommendations we get from the Department of Public Health and the Board of Health. We're really trying to follow the advice of experts. Um, and I think the struggle with this for me is anyone who's definitive, like there are people who say, um, you definitely shouldn't have canceled this or you definitely should have canceled. Anyone who's definitive, I think in this particular situation, um, um, I struggle with because it's not a definitive situation and uh, some of the decisions we're making um, in hindsight could be wrong or overly cautious, but I think that's the, I, right. I, we're, I guess we're trying to err on the side of, of caution. Yeah, and everybody watching this should realize that we're talking about, you know, the situation as we know it right now. You know, it's, it's Wednesday, March 10th, <laughs> um, or 11th? 11th. 11th, and, you know, obviously things can definitely change. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all realize it's sort of a fluid situation. Um, is there been sort of talk about what the protocol might be if a student or faculty member is either, you know, has come in contact with somebody or test positive even? So, yeah, I think Arlington's been great. Arlington, unfortunately, had one of the um, first schools in the state that had a student who was tested positive for coronavirus. And they got together with their Board of Health, the school administration, and with guidance from the Department of Public Health. And they came up with, they had to find out, like, who was in close contact with that student that was showing symptoms, um, or was positive, actually, after they did the testing. And close contact, um, again, my understanding was somebody that had been within six feet of that individual for more than 10 minutes. Um, and, and then if somebody had had, again, somehow exchanged bodily secretions, like I don't know if the high five or handshakes or that type of contact would have been also considered close contact. And, um, and they kept 30 kids home after they went through the list of students that they felt were close contact. So those are kind of the guidelines the DPH has given right now. I know um, I talked to Susan Luminello and said, is it okay to share these guidelines from the Arlington case? And she said she thought that was a great um, starting point. So we do have people in, in Burlington that are living with people that are self-quarantined. I want to be clear. Self-quarantined because they had close contact with someone who later tested positive or was a presumptive positive. We have nobody related to our school community as of right now talking that we're aware of, right. a staff member or a student who has these symptoms or has been uh, you know, presumptive positive. We have, that would change the game for us in Burlington. We, at that point, we would have a meeting with the Board of Health, the, the administration, be back in contact with the DPH to talk about the guidelines they put in place in Arlington. Is that still what we're following? And, and we would make a plan from there. Do we need to close that school for a day? I know that's been in Wellesley and Arlington. They've closed the school for a day when that first came out that a student or staff member was impacted and like deep cleaned that school. And then Arlington's back in school um, at that school where they had a student test 
you know, positive. So it, it remains to be seen right. if those if those precautions change, but that's where we're at right now. Um, that's my understanding. Okay. And Wellesley was actually just an early dismissal. Yeah. And then we're trying to make sure that we have multiple people um, knowledgeable. So again, we, we look like we're in uniform today. <laughs> yeah. uh, part of the reason you're talking to uh, both of us is uh, we don't know what our situation is going to be. If I have to uh, uh, self-quarantine, Patrick is probably more capable than I am to, to run the district. And well, now we've been sitting here for 10 minutes in close contact. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> we don't know. So, uh, so again, we're just trying to make sure that we have um, people identified who can um, pick up um, um, important responsibilities, um, you know, moving forward, if w whatever happens. Yeah. Um. Now, this whole conversation was sort of meant to answer this one last question that I had, but maybe this would be a good way to, to end and recap. Just, you know, parents are watching and they, you know, just concerned, you know, you know, they don't really know what to think. What would you say to them just to sort of encourage them that, you know, everything that can be done is being done? Um, that it appears to me in what I've read and what I've been told by experts, again, I'm not making this up, that um, the virus seems to have a relatively low impact on um, children age 18 and younger. So I would say one of the um, things that I hope, um, one of the facts that I hope gives parents some reassurance is that um, I think kids can be carriers. I think kids can obviously catch the, the virus or be impacted by the virus, but they, they have, um, it doesn't seem to impact them the same way as it does um, uh, adults over, I think they said over 60 or over 70, or if they have a, uh, a immune system that's been compromised in right. some way. So I would say uh, the adults in terms of their families or extended families, um, most of the attention should be paid to um, elderly members of the family or uh, members of the family who have a um, compromised immune system. And I think those are the precautions. I think we're t working with any staff members or faculty members who sort of fit the risk category. Um, more than likely, again, the kids are going to be fine. Again, we're going to have to manage the contagion and mitigate the spread. Um, but um, I think the reassurance for parents is that um, Again, it seems like the uh, younger kids, eight, again, 18, our, our population of students right. um, are, are relatively uh, safe in terms of this particular outbreak. Again, at this time, given the knowledge that I have now um, and, and from there. But I think what we're now um, being um, part of a larger conversation about mitigation across the community, and then some of our school decisions are going to be um, um, not just about uh, the school or the school environment, but then about the broader community. Okay. And that's really why we have to make sure we continue to talk outside of the schools um, with the town. And again, Paul Sagarino has been great, readily available. Susan Luminello, um, again, is, is uh, we, we've been talking on Saturday, Sunday. Uh, yeah. She's available all the time. So, um, and, and I think that's, so again, our primary concern is always schools, but I think we're looking at this from a community health perspective um, as well. And again, I would just tell parents that uh, know um, who's at most risk given uh, what we know about the virus and just, and just uh, be mindful of that. Um, yeah, if they have questions, they can email, like call, like if they're concerned, if there's something that's just weighing on their mind, like call mm -hmm. us and if we don't have the answer, we'll call the Board of Health. If they don't have the answer, they'll call the DPH. Again, it's a... It's a unique situation. We haven't dealt like some, with something like this before. So questions are fine. We're happy to answer them rather than to have somebody's anxiety grow. Okay, excellent. Well, I appreciate you both coming in. I know it was sort of short notice, like I said at the top, but I, uh, I think it's important for people to, to hear from you. I know there's a lot of focus on this and a lot of focus on schools and what they're doing. So I uh, thank you both for coming in and sharing your thoughts. Right, and uh, we usually shake hands, Rich, but we okay. have to do, uh, have to do the uh, elbow bump. Thanks. And, Thanks, uh, and um, again, th th there's not a formulaic response to this particular situation at this time. So, um, we, again, we may be back tomorrow if, if things change, but we'll try to continue to communicate. Uh, the information we're, we're putting up um, almost daily at this point would be on the Burlington Schools website, which right. is burlingtonpublicschools.org, and um, we're trying to 
make that a place where people can get information if they need it, but we're always available by telephone and, and again, uh, the Board of Health and the Department of Public Health are also great resources. Very good. All right. Well, if anything new comes up, we'll sure we'll be in contact and we'll try to let everybody know. All right. Great. Once thank again, you. thank you. So there you have it. A look at what is being done to address the Novid coronavirus, how residents can best protect themselves from getting sick, how the Board of Health trains and prepares for just these types of situations, and what is being done at Burlington Public Schools in response to the virus. I'd like to thank my guests, Board of Health member Dr. Wayne Saltzman, Superintendent Eric Conti, and Assistant Superintendent Patrick Larkin. I'd also like to thank all of you for watching. Remember, wash your hands, cover your mouth with your arm when, you, when coughing or sneezing, and if you feel unwell, call your doctor. We'll be back next month with another edition of B News In Depth, so stay tuned.